Well, what a morning it's been, amen? amen? It's always good to be in the house of the Lord, especially here at the Bamble Church of Christ. It's good to be with you again. And uh, I want to thank David for the opportunity to, to share a word with you this morning. Uh, I, I'm a little discouraged or disappointed. I, I, that fish, right? In that, I, I want a pulpit like that to preach from. <laughs> But I thought if I asked for it, I might end up in a fish suit, uh, which wouldn't be a good thing. <laughs> Apparently, that's what you do with your preachers around here. But it's good to be here with, uh, with David, with this church, uh, with the leadership. And uh, it's an honor to get to speak with you this morning. Uh, how about this series through the minor prophets? Right? Just minor praise for the minor prophets, huh? That's what they always do. <laughs> No, I, these are important books for our time, right? With messages that it's incredible how relevant these words are. We can focus on the VBS stories, and those are wonderful stories. And one of them today, Jonah, is one of those VBS stories that we'll talk about. But these lesser known books, these smaller books, they are incredibly relevant for our own world and our time. And today's texts are no different. David asked me uh, that I had to cover two books this morning, and I knew about Jonah. It took a little research on Nahum, I'll be honest. I've never preached a sermon on the book of Nahum before, much less a series about Nahum, which I can't imagine. Maybe that's uh, down the road for you, David, to get to do. Uh, but these uh, books actually go together, I think, quite well. And uh, I titled this message, Two Tales of One City, because both Jonah and Nahum were Jewish prophets whose prophetic work was directed toward a single city, the city of Nineveh. And yet, though they're focused on the same city, their messages are vastly different. You might wonder, how could these two messages be given to the same cities? And that begs the question, why? Why do we have two books that are related to the city of Nineveh? And why are their messages so vastly Different. We're going to talk about that and what that might have to do with our lives in 2023. But I want to open with a word of prayer this morning. So would you bow with me? God, we come before you this morning. We magnify your name as we have done. We lift up you as the God above all gods, the name above all names. God, we have people in this city that need the messages of Jonah and Nahum. We need the messages of Jonah and Nahum. And so, God, would you allow us the discernment today in this choose-your-own-adventure to know what book we need most in this moment, for both of these messages are true of who you are. So, God, in the midst of whatever bias we might have about the message that we want to preach or the message that we need to receive, I pray your spirit this morning would invite us to reflect again and to see what would draw us closer to the name of Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. If I were to ask you what you remember about the story of Jonah, my guess is it might have something to do with a fish. There is a fish in this story, but this story is not about a fish. We like to tell the story of Jonah like it's a children's Bible story, but I think we subconsciously remember it that way so that we don't have to deal with the incredibly tough message of this book. We domesticate this story, though, to our own peril. The plot of the story of Jonah becomes uh, very obvious very quick. So if you have your Bibles, feel free to open there to Jonah chapter 1. You can, it's just two, two books later that Nahum is there. So if you're in, in the pages of Scripture, it's pretty easy to move back and forth. Jonah 1 verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Let me show you on on a map where these places are because uh, we don't know these places in our own day. If, If that's up there, you can see it. So he's in Joppa, right? He goes down to Joppa and he's on his way to Tarshish, but... Nineveh is where God has called him, not exactly where God has directed him to go. You see the problem here. So my my question this morning that I'm going to come back to is, why does Jonah, a prophet of God, disobey God's command to go to Nineveh? This is the key question. Because if you get the answer to this question wrong, you're going to miss the entire point of the book of Jonah. 
And if you miss the point of the book of Jonah, you won't understand the tension between Jonah and Nahum. So why is God, uh, why does Jonah, a prophet of God, disobey God's command to go to Nineveh? We're going to come back to that question in a bit. But first, let's dig into this lesser known book of Nahum. So you can turn over a couple books forward if you're in your scriptures or if you're on your phones, you can find your way there. We're going to read a little bit out of the book of Nahum. We need a little bit of brushing up probably. Uh, but some context first. Jonah, if, back to the book of Jonah. Jonah lived and prophesied during the reign of King Jeroboam, which places the books of the book, uh, the, the events of the book of Jonah to about 780 to 750 B.C. Now, Nahum is going to prophesy 150 years later than that. So these books are separated, both prophecies to Nineveh, by 150 years. Now, why are those dates significant? Well, in the 150 years between these books and the events in these books, Assyria has conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. So before, right, when Jonah is preached, Israel's whole, there's the northern and the southern kingdom, there's some division, of course, but the exile of the northern kingdom has happened between when Jonah is written and when Nahum will come along and give his prophecy. So Jonah's prophesying to Israel before the exile, Nahum is prophesying to the southern kingdom of Judah in a completely different situation than Jonah was. Nahum's audience knew that exile was possible because they had seen it. They heard the stories of what had happened in that devastation about these people, some that would have been neighbors and friends and loved ones, stories in, in long past in Israel that had been exiled off elsewhere. And so Nahum is writing to encourage the people of Judah to not so prematurely capitulate to Assyria who was on their horizon. They knew that exile was a possibility for them. And the concern is that, well, if that happened to the north, it can happen to us. And so we might as well just give up. This is what God's going to do. Now they know that God can hand them over if their sin accumulates and they don't repent and find some measure of forgiveness. And so Nahum is writing to let God's people know that God sees the evil that the Ninevites have done. And their evil and their sin will not go unpunished. And let's make it clear, the Ninevites were evil. A, a word about Nineveh. Nineveh is in what is known as modern-day Iraq. Nineveh was the largest city in the world until it was destroyed by the Babylonians and their allies in 612 B.C., the, the days that follow Nahum's prophecy. The Assyrians were brutal people. They actually invented ways of killing people that I won't even get into today to, to, to cause it to be painful and torture to go along with it, just awful things. And the book of Nahum actually describes the evil of Nineveh, and that's where I want to pick up in Nahum uh, chapter 1, verse 1. A prophecy concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up. He makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel uh, wither and the blossoms of Lebanon fade. The mountains quake before him and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him, but with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into the realm of darkness. And in case it isn't yet clear, he clarifies in verse 14 what's coming. The Lord has given a command concerning you, Nineveh. You will have no descendants to bear your name. I will destroy the images and idols that are in the temples of your, God, of your gods. I will prepare your grave, for you are vile. Now what exactly are they guilty of, these Ninevites? Well, we read about that in chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims. The crack of whips, the clatter of wheels, galloping horses and jolting chariots. 
Charging cavalry, flashing swords, glittering spears. Many casualties, piles of dead, bodies without number. People stumbling over the corpses. All because of the wanton lust of a prostitute. Alluring the mistress of sorceries who enslaved nations by her prostitution and peoples by her witchcraft. I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. I will lift your skirts over your face. I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. Any questions now about these Ninevites? And how do the enemies of Nineveh feel about their demise? Well, we read about that in the first part of Nahum 3, verse 19. Nothing can heal you. Your wound is fatal. And all who hear the news about you clap their hands at your fall. The Ninevites aren't exactly what you would call righteous people. Israel has experienced their brutality. And God doesn't put up with that kind of evil forever. So what's the central point of the book of Nahum after reading these words? For Nahum, the fall of Nineveh is being presented as an example, as an image of how God is at work in history in every age. He will not allow the arrogance or violence of the world to endure forever. And so the message of Nahum is similar, actually, to the message of Daniel. Assyria stands in a long line of violent empires throughout history. And Nineveh's fate is a memorial to God's commitment to bring down the violent and the arrogant in every age. So back to the question I posed earlier. Why does Jonah, a prophet of God, disobey God's command to go to Nineveh? Now the answer is found in the story, if we'll read it as more than a story about just a fish. So Jonah goes on the run. And he ends up on a ship setting sail for Tarshish. And and Tarshish is not like Nineveh. Tarshish is in modern day Spain, as we saw on that map earlier. It was a paradise on the beach near the Strait of Gibraltar. But more importantly, it's far away from Nineveh. So he gets on board a ship and he sets sail as far away from Nineveh as possible. And God sends a violent storm and his boat is in trouble. Now he's on board with a bunch of pagans... And when the storm hits, the sailors start praying to their gods. And Jonah is asleep. We know about stories of people sleeping during storms, right? And there are brilliant ironies in the book of Jonah. I mean, just pay attention as the story goes along about the ironies that are found in this. It's meant to be humorous. It's meant for you to pay attention and say, what in the world is going on in this story? Irony number one, the pagans are praying and Jonah is asleep. And so they wake up. And they tell him to start praying to his God. And that doesn't work. So they cast lots to find out who is responsible for the storm. In those days, people assumed that the gods sent storms because humans had somehow upset them along the way. Jonah tells them, listen, if if you throw me into the sea, then the sea will calm down. But the sailors refuse and they try to row back to land. So irony number two. These pagans are trying to save Jonah's life, and Jonah's trying to end his life. And so they try to row back to land. He says, no. So finally, the sailors agree to throw him overboard. And as they do it, they pray to God, asking forgiveness for the act that they had done to throw him overboard. And guess what happens? The sailors make promises and sacrifices to God. And as soon as Jonah hits the water, the raging sea grows calm, and these people somehow see the salvation of God. But Jonah doesn't die. A big fish comes to swallow him. Jonah can't get away from God. Jonah can't even end his own life. And here's a reminder for all of us who wonder about the storms and fish that may come our way. God doesn't just provide blessings to save us. Sometimes the very storms and fish that swallow us are the salvation he provides. And so if right now you're in a storm, I want to assure you, God sees. And it may just be the salvation you can't imagine as you go on, as you pray in the fish, as David spoke of earlier. Well, Jonah doesn't pray on the boat, but he sure starts praying in the fish. And after three days and nights, God commands the fish to to spit out Jonah onto dry land. So God returns to Jonah and calls him to go to Nineveh. And Jonah is like, all right, I'll go this time. And you can tell he's real excited to be there. When you hear the message that he preaches to these people. 
His whole sermon is eight words in English. In the Hebrew, it's only five words. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overturned. What a sermon that is, right? I mean, what a failure of a message. I mean, this is terrible preaching. Can I get an amen? (laughs) Now, some of you would love a message to be a little shorter that way. And so maybe he's going for something well there. But the sermon doesn't call for anyone to do anything. It's just a pronouncement of doom. So Jonah has to be the worst missionary of all time, right? No invitation given, no opportunity for repentance, just this is the way it's going to be. But watch what happens. This is in Jonah uh, chapter 3, beginning in verse 5. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? Maybe God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. And when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Are you kidding me? How in the world does a sermon like that get a response like that? Yes, Jonah doesn't give the invitation, but the king of Nineveh knows how to give an invitation. And the whole nation repents. Even the animals are involved in this act of repentance. And God relents. He forgives them. Jonah is the most successful failure of all time. So you'd think Jonah would be feeling pretty good about himself in that moment. Until you read what happens in chapter 4. Jonah 4 verse 1. But to Jonah this seemed very wrong. and He became angry. Jonah Jonah is not happy. He's angry with God. And and what we're about to read is the turning point in the book of Jonah. Jonah reveals the answer to the question that I've been asking this morning. Why does Jonah, a, a prophet of God, disobey God in this moment? Why does he go to Tarshish instead of to Nineveh? Let's keep reading in Jonah 4 in verse 2. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Did you catch that? Why does Jonah not go to Nineveh? It's not that he's scared they're going to kill him, as awful as these Ninevites are. It's not fear that's leading him to go to this beach town near the Strait of Gibraltar. He doesn't want to go preach to his enemies because he knows he can't count on God to be as angry with the Ninevites as he is. He knows if given the chance, God's a pushover and he's going to forgive these people that are evil. And Jonah doesn't want that. He knows God too well. This is not a misunderstanding of who God is. He knows God's probably going to protect him in this sense. He knows the story of Daniel and others that have been up against empires. It's not a question of his own safety. He knows God too well, and he doesn't like the God he knows that well. Jonah didn't run from Nineveh because he was afraid. Uh Uh-oh. He knows God because he's grown up with the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures. In in Exodus 34, I want to go to this passage real quick. This is a passage that that Jonah likely knows, maybe coming to mind in the midst of this. Jonah 34, verse 6. This is the God that Jonah knows all too well. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, rebellion and sin. Jonah didn't run from Nineveh because he was afraid he wouldn't come out alive. He ran from Nineveh because he didn't want the Ninevites to come out alive. Jonah is angry because God isn't. So why does Jonah disobey God and run for Tarshish? Because he knows the character of God all too well. 
He knows that God doesn't give up on humans. He knows that God will offer grace and mercy if the Ninevites truly repent of their ways. And that's a problem for Jonah. And sometimes if we're honest, it's a problem for us, isn't it? Last time I was here, or maybe two times ago, I was preaching on forgiveness. And I had a list up with me. 20 people that I realized I had not forgiven in my life. And so I asked you to make a list. Make a list of the people you want to want to forgive. Now, you you may not be there to want to forgive them, but these are people you want to want to forgive. Let's just start there. And I got to confess this morning, I still have those 20 people on my list. I thought I would be further along at this point. But I'm realizing it's a lot harder than I thought it would be. I've come across some of those people. I've had conversations with some of those people. I'm still in process. I hope maybe you made that list and you're making a little better progress than I am. But if I'm honest, it's a problem how merciful God is. Now, I want the mercy of God for myself. I just don't want God to be that generous with others. And so there's a, there's a tension in the Minor Prophets, these two books. For a moment, I want to encourage you to take in these two scriptures. And I want you to reflect on the message of Jonah and the message of Nahum that you're about to see. These two verses are the two that I've been sitting uh, in tension with because there's two messages that are presented in in these two books, 150 years apart from each other. Jonah 4 verse, verse 2, the second part says this, I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. In juxtaposition to Nahum 1 verse 2, The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. Well, which is it? Which one's right about God? How do we hold the tension of these two verses that are in the Bibles that we carry around and study? I think this is why David wanted these books to go together. It's because they seem like vastly different messages to the same city. Or maybe a more important question with these verses. Which of these pictures of God are you most drawn to? And why? Here's another question. If you were given the opportunity to be Nahum or Jonah and be what, given one of these messages to take to your enemies, which is the message that you would hope God would give you to deliver to those people? And why? I've been sitting with these questions. And I found some stuff in my soul that's not as it should be. See, the Bible is, well, it's a messy book, Right? It's multivocal. The reality is the Bible is not a book. It, it's more like a library, isn't it? 66 books written over the span of about 1,500 years. 40 plus authors and editors written in three different languages, multiple genres. It's a library. Now we carry it around as if it's a single book, but this book is a book filled with books. And when we read it as a single book, it's, it's easy to it. And tempting to flatten all these different books into a collection of easily referenced Bible verses we can gather and combine to make the Bible say just about anything we want it to say. When we see it as a single book, we expect it to speak with one voice, right? We expect consistency. And that's one of the primary goals that an editor does when they think about editing a book, right? Is an author comes, writes all of this, hands it over to an editor, and an editor's going to look at that saying, does it make a consistent argument, right? Is there consistency in what's here? What needs to be teased out, left out, added to make sure there's a message that's delivered? But when you go to a library, do you expect the library to deliver one message? No. You walk into a library and there's this genre and there's this genre. And if you're going on a beach vacation, you you might go for a particular genre. And if you're going to to research something as a student, you might go to a different part of the library. You're going to this library realizing it has all these different voices and you don't expect it to say one consistent thing. 66 books, as diverse as scripture is, the Bible is addressing one major subject. Let's be clear about that. God. And God is a pretty big subject. 
The various authors of the Bible sometimes talk about God and what life with God is like from different perspectives, from different angles to different audiences. Even Nineveh spoke in 150 years apart in different situations. And this is what it means to say that the Bible is multi-vocal. Inspired by the same Holy Spirit, but written to different situations and different contexts. It would sure be nice to know what in the world Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians. To have a video of what that service would have been like and the questions that are being sent to him. It's not just a book he writes, it's a book responding to particular questions. Jonah and Nahum have truths to reveal about God. Truths that need to be heard in our world. Jonah knows the character of God so well that he doesn't want to travel to Nineveh to represent a gracious and compassionate God to his enemies. And Jonah is right. God is a gracious and compassionate God. But Nahum has an important truth to tell as well. In his prophetic message to Nineveh, he's trying to remind Judah that God will not allow evil, violence, and injustice to go on forever. And that's a reminder to those who've been taken advantage of that you need to hear. God sees, and he hears, and he responds. He's a God of justice. There's a tension inherent in these books. God is a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. God is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. So for you this morning, which message do you think the world needs more in this moment? But maybe the most important question isn't what we think. Maybe the more important question is to ask in light of who Jesus is, who's the center of this book, who's the one this book points to, the one in whom life is found, the one who offers abundant life, which of these messages represents who Jesus clarifies God to be? Because we find out later on that Jesus is the exact representation of God, the, the manifestation of his being. If you want to know what God is like, you look at Jesus. And you see clearly who God is in all of Scripture. Which of these messages sounds more like the Sermon on the Mount? Which of these messages reflects the Spirit of God? Whose fruit is born out in love and joy and peace and patience, kindness and goodness and faithfulness. These messages are both true messages. The question for us is, which message do you want to deliver? Which message do you most want to be true about you and your situation and why? And what it means to grapple with the text, what it means to receive the message of the Holy Spirit is to sit under these messages and ask the question, what am I drawn to and why and what looks like Jesus and what forms a church to be the kind of church that can be God's people in the world? It, it's probably going to be both of these at different times. But learning to discern which one and what season and what points us to Jesus is what it means to be people who are filled with the Spirit of God that allow us to deliver the good news to those in the world. Let's close uh, with a word of prayer this morning as we continue to discern this word from God. God, we know this to be true of you. You're a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. And you're a God who's jealous and avenging. You're a God who takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. And sometimes we don't know what to do with these messages. But we confess these both are the word of God, found in the scriptures you've given to us. So God, we allow this word not to be something we master this morning, not to be something that we come with the right answer and are able to deliver to others. We allow this word to interrogate us, to master us. We don't do that through our own ingenuity and minds. We do that through your Holy Spirit, who is a gift to those who have been baptized into Christ. And who calls those who are not yet baptized into Christ, into the Christ life. So God, we ask this week as we sit with these texts, these tensions, this library, we ask that you would do your work in our lives so that we might offer to others what has been offered to us. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.